Hi, Stephen. Hey, John. All right, Stephen. So there's no more appropriate way, and have a seat here. Yeah, there's no more appropriate way to talk to the man responsible for the $80 billion USIT budget than, than to show a, a family portrait <laughs> of, of your family. And, and so leading from this, uh, if, do you want to do you want to explain this picture to us and, and uh, who's in this? Sure. Audience? That's uh, <laughs> this is a surprise. Um, <laughs> we have our sources. <laughs> That's uh, Halloween, I think, two years ago in Washington, D.C. That's me as Darth Vader, even though I think I'm part of the rebel alliance in the government. Um, and then the rest of my family, a family friend from Seattle is Chewbacca, and then are my two neighbors uh, are, the, are the stormtroopers. But, uh, that's, so that's, some true yeah, geek cred here. I, you are a real geek. Yeah, let's we, go, because let, of that, we, uh, we, yeah, actually, we actually we got, we got you, couple, you a little gift. We got you a little gift. This is the uh, Darth Vader piggy bank that we got for uh. you. <laughs> and um, also uh, Vader's little princess that you can take home oh, for, awesome. for the kids. This is awesome. So, Yes. And then of course we, know you, we know you have a big collection of Star Wars uh, here, do. so we have to add to it. The, yes. to the photograph, I am, I am uh, I think your, your prior discussion with Chris, I'm one of the geek dads yes, up there. Yes, so. absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. So who would win in a battle, Darth Vader? Darth Iron Vader, Man. I mean, no, it, don't even go down that road. Yeah, somebody, somebody already responded on Twitter, Todd, duh. <laughs> you know, I think speaking, speaking of Twitter, the metal, if, I didn't mention this in the last session, but if you do have questions for any of the sessions, just I'm following the tweet stream up here. If you have something for Stephen Van Roekel, uh, just tweet to GW Summit, and we'll be checking that, and we might be able to ask your questions. So go ahead and do that. All right, so turning serious for a moment here, you know, this is one of your last public appearances, perhaps even your last public appearance I as the so. U.S. Chief Information yeah. Officer before you move on to lead the U.S. response to the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Yeah. And we want to get into that in just a minute. But looking back on your tenure as CIO, what are you most proud of? And, and then as a counter to that, what do you wish you could have accomplished that you didn't quite get to? Well, the, the, the thing I'm probably most proud of is you look across the, the government. The government's a big place. You know, a lot of people may think we, we run sort of an enterprise of, of IT. We're more of a sector of the economy. And so I think a lot of what we've done, both the, the positive and the wish I would have done, kind of reflects on that. The, the positive is really about the, the the groundwork we laid that's going to transform the way that our country and the world does business in the space of technology. You know, we, we finding the government in 2009, you know, I, like, uh, like it was mentioned, I was at Microsoft for a lot of times. I helped launch Windows XP. I was surprised my first day in the government in 2009 to jiggle a mouse and see it there waiting for me <laughs> nearly a decade after we had launched it. And, and it was just, IT and technology was seen as this very discretionary thing in government. When I was a kid, the government led in technology. You know, the militarization, the mil spec kind of you know technology built into ruggedizing laptops or the birth of the internet. All of that came from uh, the government, and the government had sort of lost its way. Um, it was really a, a, a slow follower in the realm of, of, of the use of technology. Technology was the ability to print or check your email or call the help desk. It wasn't the way you connect with your customer, the way you do, you know, make yourself product, product, productive, the way you do the business uh, of government. And so we had to really kind of get into a mode of, of teaching people that you know, technology was this very strategic thing, that it had a, a role to play in not only communicating to Americans, but, but governing and, uh, and, uh, and customer service and everything else that, that is so important around the government. And so the, the proud point is really probably points where we just did some foundational work. You know, the cloud first policy in the government kind of led the way. Um, the, the work we did on, uh, have done around cybersecurity. You know, you have technology sitting in your iPhone or your Samsung Galaxy S4 or your Microsoft phone that was specced by the government in, in the time I was there. That, that makes those devices more secure. Uh, the work we did on open data, we put on, I put on an executive, or uh, the president put on an executive order, I put on a policy in 2013 that basically orders government that any data we collect, use, or disseminate has to be done in open machine readable ways, uh, and so much more. And all of those things I think are gonna bear fruit a decade from now, but we laid that foundation. And then as far as getting you know, what, what I wish I would have done, uh, it's really around the, the cultural transformation of such a large organization. There's still you know, work to be done to promote uh, technology and the role technology plays in our government and, and push that into uh, you know, the, the business of government, which will then affect so many other sectors of not only our economy, but the world. And there, there's, uh, we're, we're on a good track, but there's work to be done. Yeah, just kind of building on that same, same thesis there, when we met a few weeks ago, you told us a story about the uh, I think it was the U.S. Department of Agriculture when you came in 
to office, they, they had 21 different email systems and the secretary couldn't send an email simultaneously to his entire staff or departments. Right. And this was part of the mess that you encountered in coming in and just speaks to the bureaucracy that was there. I know you've made strides in that, but how successful do you think you were in trying to, uh, to clean up that mess, if you will? Yeah. And were you successful in, in those things? And is the Department of Agriculture secretary now able to send one email? Yeah, absolutely. He is. Okay, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, have, they have one email system, it's cloud-based, they have one way of buying devices, they have one way of doing almost everything. And in the scale that is the U.S. government, that represents about $500 million in savings across the, across the, the culmination of the licenses and all the things they were doing. Just which, wiping out the, t the other 20 email systems. 20 email systems yeah. and then the teams and all the other things that were supporting those, uh, those systems and everything else. And it was really, you know, in the private sector, you wake up every day thinking about how am I going to you know, promote uh, you know, uh, benefit to my customer, how am I going to control my costs, how am I going to increase value while keeping my, flat, my, my cost line flat or declining. And in the government, there was this mentality that to do more, I must spend more, that kind of this, this notion of depreciation that we have in the private sector that says I must take from the old to give to the new, I must be virtuous and continually improving, just wasn't there. And in 2008, with the financial crisis and, and moving into a mode where just federal budgets aren't growing and, and we're actually on a very good track of keeping those under control, uh, but the role of technology is over increasing, like how do you make those th things meet in the middle where you spend less but do more technology? And the way you do that is you first teach government that you, you have to go in and just clean up anything that just is wasteful spending. Um, but efficiency isn't a rallying cry. I mean, people don't come and work in government because, wow, I can run a really awesome email system or I can, I can clean this, this or that mess up or anything uh, like that. It's, it's really about the mission and how, how are you, you know, meeting the mission. And so the, the proof point had to be showing them that you can bring these sort of common sense techniques to, to clean up the mess while then taking that money and reinvesting it in, in more mission outcomes. What did you learn? Uh, from the initial rollout of healthcare.gov? Yeah, we, we learned, uh, I learned a lot, as you can imagine. Um, uh, you know, the, the government's very decentralized in that the, it, it is the departments and agencies of government that actually implement technology and everything else. And something that you sort of take for granted, and I'm sure mo many of you probably see, take for granted in government, but you see in your private sector lives is, you know, there's sort of different people that are good at starting and people that are good at finishing. The builders and the runners are, are tends to be separate sort of groups. And, and what we have in government are typically more people that are good at running and less good at building. And, and so getting uh, kind of building capacity to, to, to strike that balance, because we have such a heavy reliance on the vendors out there to come in and build things in government with laws and regulations that aren't set up for success in that building. So what I learned is, is really there's, there's sort of three major components that we focused on in the kind of post-healthcare.gov point. One is getting more involved in, in the important stuff that government's doing from a central capacity standpoint, bringing in talent, working on that, and that's all about the people. The second is that those, those partners, those vendors out there, can we create a dynamic in government where more uh, small, innovative companies can actually take advantage of this 80, $82 billion that we spend on technology and, and come and work in government versus sort of the heavy reliance on the, the very large incumbent companies that tend to kind of just repeat things that have done in the past. Um, and then third is around kind of just process. Like there's, there's work to be done in cleaning up the laws and regulations. You know, fundamental uh, parts of US law that govern the way we do technology, like the Privacy Act, the Paperwork Reduction Act, uh, and others were, were all written before the, even the notion of the internet existed and, and uh, you know, don't reference the internet. You know, it's very hard to do A-B testing. It's very hard to do agile uh, and modular kind of approaches, which are just, you know, normal place everywhere else. Yeah. Well, and to that point, you've actually been heavily involved in ensuring that the next healthcare.gov does not happen. You have uh, been overseeing an initiative called the U.S. Digital Service. Right. It's really about bringing a private sector mentality to the government and, and learning from things that happen in large technology companies. How's that going so far, and, and does it mean that we're gonna avoid that, that next healthcare.gov? Well, you know, you know, we're, we're a big enough place that you, know, you always have to look out for what's going on, but it, it's a, um, the digital service is really about creating a home within the government where the private sector largely, or the best in, people in government can, t can go into more of a central capacity to go help the agencies of government build and deliver uh, technology solutions. So, um, you know, 
instead of allow, allowing or having the agencies themselves go out and hire a vendor or bring people in, this team has basically said, here's the, here's the most important things government's working on, and that list is about 30 to 50 you know, sort of big things. And they're, they're apparent, you know, things around veterans or education, health, energy, all these other things that, uh, that, are, that are, uh, the team would focus on. And then this digital service really has kind of three types of people in them. One are people that we've hired from the private sector who, like me, sort of made the choice to jump across the continent and work in the halls of government uh, in this central capacity. Um, we have, we're very excited that, that Mikey Dickerson, who was, the, who was a site reliability manager for, um, for Google and uh, was one of the, one of the key players um, that came in to help us with the recovery post uh, healthcare.gov, um, is running that team as my deputy um, there. Uh, so we have private sector people. The second is, is the best in government because there are some incredible, amazing people in government that land rovers on Mars that do you know, amazing things, uh, creating a home for them to have more broad impact across government. And the third is we're working with the private sector on allowing in a non-conflicted way, private sector employees like all of you to take a rotation in government, take a sabbatical, take three months, come work for your government and, and work on important stuff. And we, we promise that you, uh, we aren't tasking people with working on email systems. It's really about like come solve this big problem and, and, uh, and that is, uh, and so far so good. We've got amazing turnout and people are, people are on board and helping. So you, you've had to root out inefficiency, and I know a lot of the startups that are out there and business leaders are out there are all about rooting out inefficiency in their own businesses. You know, in your role as CIO of, over the last three years, what, what are the startup lessons you've learned in trying to manage and operate and bring more of that startup mentality to uh, government? Uh, are, there, are there a couple that you can share with, uh, share with the crowd that yeah, might be useful sure. tips? It's, uh, you know, first it starts, with, it starts with data and people. You know, it's data, data, data. You gotta think about how do you go in and understand what your cost structures are, what things look like? I mean, we could have anecdotal conversations with the Department of Agriculture saying that here's why, you know, in, from a common sense standpoint, 21 email systems don't make sense. But if I can sit down with like, or I can walk into the room with like the publisher's clearinghouse check, that, you know, the, the balloons yeah. that say, here's $500 million that you're, you could actually have to go spend <laughs> on other things, that gets their attention. Uh -huh. So you motivating know, them. Motivating <laughs> them through that. And the second yeah. is, is just understand incentives and dynamics and other things that you, uh, you know, it's, it's a, um, you know, just it, the funny thing about government is because you don't have a, a p &L, you don't have, a, a, you know, a stock price, you don't have things that are sort of driving intrinsic behavior around cost structures, a lot of times people will see me taking money away from you to do something more efficiently as me taking away your authority or me taking away your ability to maybe choose how to manage that money to do other things, and a budget reduction feels like a, like a take back. Um, and, and what you have to show them is that, you know, one is, is when you work in a, in a company, you may know that as I contribute to this company, even if I'm not growing my own budget, I'm contributing to the bottom line of the company, the stock price, the success of the company by funding new ventures or doing new things, is understanding that collective will of how important it is to kind of manage the organism versus manage just a, a cell in the organism. And so getting them to understand that notion and, and the, the greater good of the work they do really comes from you know, inspiring them through their mission, showing them data around what they're trying to get done, and, and, uh, and do this in a way that can kind of, kind of push, the, push the motivation forward. So. Yeah. so you've had the rare distinction of working not only for President Obama as the CIO, but also for Bill Gates as his strategy assistant and speechwriter. So who is the tougher boss, Bill <laughs> Gates or President Obama? That is a great question. Does I've President never had Obama an answer. say that's the stupidest effing question I've ever heard? <laughs> President Obama has never said that to me. Uh, um, and Bill Gates has said that to you how many times? Many times, but I, I, I never held that distinction long because there was always someone later that day, yes. and it was it was always a badge of honor when he when he did say it. Um, uh, you know, uh, President Obama has a much bigger military than you know to the Darth Vader point that you're, the kid made in the video, so maybe that's tougher, but. I don't know, I'd say, I've got a track record for working for Harvard grads or dropouts, so I don't know if any of you, uh, <laughs> you went to Harvard, I don't know. That's, yeah. that's a question I just won't answer. <laughs> <laughs> what, is, what has it been like for you, though, going essentially from the private sector, you know, Redmond, Washington, uh, through a couple of securitist routes to the White House? What, what has that been like? Has, 
how is the culture different? I, I think people would really like to hear your insights on life, life inside the executive branch. Well, it, it's, it's, one, it's just an incredible life adventure, you know, from the standpoint of, of living in history. And, the, you know, for a while of my tenure, I was in William Tecumseh Sherman's office in this building in nice. the White House. And it, just stuff like that is just incredible. And I'm a history buff, uh, you know, through and through. But more so, what was amazing to me was, you know, working alongside these, these amazing people in government who have made a life choice to serve their public, to serve their country, you know, without, a st you know, without stock benefits, without free sodas and M&Ms, without, without, you know, all the things that come with just the, the amazing, you know, the, the great part of working in the private sector. And they, they get up every day and they do this, this work to, to help out uh, their country. And I, I didn't really understand why, you know, from, from across the country. You, know, you kind of get this, there's people that just do good and do things like that. But what I realized is that working in Microsoft, I got to, in working side by side with Bill, I got to help him, you know, launch the first Xbox, Windows XP, as I mentioned. I also helped him a bit on transitioning the Gates Foundation from its focus on technology to world health. And, and I was with him in India, in a slum clinic in New Delhi, India, when he rolled up his sleeves and dropped some of the first polio vaccines in kids' mouths. And I, I thought to myself during this time in my life that I was at the pinnacle of impact at scale. Like, like it was never going to get better than this. You know, I will, it's, it's a downhill run from being able to drive impact. You know, 2011, the World Health Organization said that, it, that uh, uh, polio was eradicated from India. And, and you know, these, these brands that we launched back then are doing, did very well and have led to other great things. Um, but little did I know that, that I was, how wrong I was, that when I went to the US government, you know, that, that impact. Microsoft's a nice little effort. The Gates Foundation's a lovely little effort, as is Google and Amazon and everything else, compared to the collective impact that, that the U.S. government has on the world, on, on global society and democracy, and then just technology and the business environment we have here. And when you see things and you, you know that, you know, by making a, a software platform work and eight million, seven to eight million people get health insurance that didn't have it and were in desperation or, you know, that, that people are getting educated or fed or we're, you know, now going into Western Africa and helping there. There's, you know, that, that is just a, a, a moving moment in your life. And now I think I'm at the pinnacle and I'm, yeah. I'm hitting it, hitting it now. Well, let's talk about your next chapter because you are now moving on to help lead the U.S. effort to combat the Ebola virus in, in West Africa. What attracted you to that job? What, what was the challenge there that, that really made you want to say, hey, I'm on board and, and I'm headed there? Well, one is the, the, the administration, the president asking. That's, that, that always helps. Uh, uh, great, as Bill was at Microsoft, a great uh, career counselor. Um, the, you, uh, uh, the other part of it is, is really just that impact. You know, in the, as, as the U.S. Chief Information Officer, you know, I, I, I sort of manage the, the president's budget and, the, and the, the technology spend of the government. I have this ability to kind of set policy through law. I have the ability to set policy across the government, um, which we did effectively. But most of that, um, even when diving in and helping agencies kind of deliver stuff, is more in the broad brush. And at the end of the day, I'm a product guy, and I love driving direct impact. And in, in times of greatest need, one of the spirits that just sort of you know, gets to you inside government is that driving impact, and where can you go and have direct kind of mission uh, impact and so this challenge is exciting for me. One for you know the fact that it's just a it's just a meaty challenge where technology can actually come in and play a role. I think in a pretty pretty special way that maybe is not being utilized to the full extent at which it can. And two is um, I I just the notion of kind of going out there and helping on this front. In 2011, I spent the summer at the Agency for International Development helping them respond to the, the drought in the Horn of Africa. The time I spent with Bill, um, those, those are pretty special moments, and, and being able to come in and help on this is, is equally as, as cool. How can technology help to uh, stop the spread of this, this horrible disease? I mean, uh, if you watched President Obama's speech to the United Nations, I mean, this is a, a seminal moment. This is whether or not the world can stand up and stop the spread of this disease. I mean, it's, it's, in some ways, it's unprecedented. Yeah. How can technology play a role here? And the disease is just part of it. I mean, you, there, there's, 
you tend to find in these fragile political environments uh, that when things like this happen and, the, and there's such upheaval in the, in the rank um, uh, of the countries themselves, you, you get political radicalism, you get other things that sort of happen and come out of it. So it's as much a public safety uh, uh, problem because of the disease itself as it is you know, a political and, and, public, you know, and, and a national security type, type incident, as well as these countries are you know, really the, kind of the, some of the breakthrough countries on economic growth and like Liberia in particular was growing in a way that, that has become an emerging market that could, you know, there's, there's vibrancy there that a lot of people can, uh, can utilize. Technology, I think, I'm, I start on Monday, so I'm, I'm, I'm diving in on this a uh, lot, um, but I think technology can play a role in a few ways. One is, um, you know, if you think about body-worn sensors, things like that, for the healthcare workers themselves, these poor wor workers that are, these care workers that are going out have to put these suits on, they're called PPE suits, the kind of hazmat suit, stands for personal protective equipment. Uh, these suits were basically made for uh, conditioned lab environments, like a very, you know, you're in a, in a lab working in an air conditioning, it's cool to a level at which you can wear these kind of rubber, rubber suits. They weren't made for Western African summers, which, uh, you know, we're approaching right now. Doctors I've talked to have said that they can spend you know, about 20 to 40 minutes in the thing when they need to work about 12 hour shifts on these floors um, in these treatment centers. Um, and so getting, so last Friday we launched this, um, this uh, grand challenge for the private sector to help us think about how could you rapidly innovate cooling systems or other things to do that. We're putting, we're putting sensors on people right now to get a baseline of data to understand, you know, what's your body temperature during the day, what is things like that, so we have a target for these innovators to shoot at. So it's stuff like that. You think about epidemiology where I'm taking a blood sample from you, having a ruggedized tablet, having a belt-worn printer I could print a label on, just simple things like that where today that's um, that's all paper-based, uh, all play a role. So there's kind of this point of care technology. The second realm is around communications, both, both care worker communications, broadband, can I, can I upload data to a central place? Can, I, can we analyze and model that data? Um, two, can I just literally talk to other people around uh, that are helping? Um, two, looking at social campaigns and things where if I blast text messages in targeted ways out to, uh, out to the citizens of these countries, can we be more coordinated in getting them to change behavior or do things in that way? So we're kind of exploring that whole realm of communications. And then the other realm is big data, thinking about you know, contact tracing, uh, modeling uh, uh, certain behavior, modeling movement based on cell phone signal reads, um, getting those sort of things to happen and understanding, you know, can you front load aid supplies or aid clinics uh, based on certain populations and, and stuff to try to get in front of this stuff. Uh, I think there's other layers that look at travel patterns and things. This news we got out of Texas this week, right. um, working with uh, to people to look at, you know, are there are there data sources we can gather? So a lot to do in this in this space, and I think I'm I'm probably hitting the tip of the iceberg on where technology can play. Yeah. So a as you are now in your final days as the U.S. CIO, uh, just a practical question, and this is going to sound trivial after the Ebola conversation, but for for folks in the audience who are running businesses who want to become vendors uh, to the federal government and get a slice of those, that $82 billion uh, for, them, for their own businesses. What's your first practical tip? What's the first thing they need to do, apart from going through the official process? How can they position themselves and their business to be a, a, a vendor to the United States government? Well, the, the, the key there is, I think, look for, look for opportunities to enter the fray. There's a, there's a um, uh, there's a, a platform called Fed, Fed Biz Ops, and it's this federal business opportunities platform that we actually had a group of our, our digital service innovators actually re, rewrite into an open platform where you can now search for opportunities inside the, inside the government and, um, and, uh, and look for those opportunities to kind of jump in. The, there's, a, there's this really great mechanism that it has been historically very under, underutilized in government, but we're, we're really amping up. Um, it's it's going to sound very bureaucratic, but it's a simple, called the Simplified Acquisition Threshold. And it basically says that below a certain dollar figure, which is currently $150,000, um, but we're working with Congress on getting that to be much higher. Um, we, you, you don't have to follow all the kind of bureaucratic rules to enter under $150,000. It means you can kind of come in and just work. And so we're encouraging agencies in this agile, modular world to just spec minimally viable products and, uh, under the $150,000 threshold and just go out and get 
kind of more, kind of create a more vibrant ecosystem around this stuff. And so those two things are sort of coming together to create an ecosystem where small companies can come in without having to hire an army of lawyers to like navigate the, the federal bureaucracy. You can actually do some stuff. And what we've seen, in, in when I ran an agency, I ran the Federal Communications Commission's operations my first two years of government. Um, I kind of ran this play you know, uh, before I had the ability to kind of set policy around that play. And we have, we had small uh, companies come in. One of them actually was based in Portland um, and, and help us build some, some technology. And now that, that company's big and they've grown and they've, they sort of learned as they went how to work with government uh, because it is a great opportunity. Yeah. Well, Stephen Van Ruffel, this has been great. Thank you very much for being here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome story. Yes.